God has a special message for you today. And it will be the whole truth in one book. So basically, we are going to be talking about the Bible. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, once again, we are before you. And we are asking that you speak to our hearts. You speak to our minds. And may your Holy Spirit be with us to give us understanding of your word. And give us the ability to dwell in your word walk in your word and allow ourselves for your word to prepare us for your soon return. It's our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. I'm talking about the Bible. In past years, books, as we see now, have gone through series of changes. So the idea came that whatever we do, we need to keep record of them. And so for recipes, for record keeping, for historical whatever, we want to keep things such that the next generation are able to read, interpret, and understand that this and that happened. And so that was the idea behind books. And before the books that we have now came, our forefathers began to write and make inscriptions in caves. They were drawings at the time trying to tell um, this person was married to that person. They gave birth to this person. They lived in this particular place. They did this trade, all in inscriptions. And so when the next generation came in the caves, they could read and understand the people that already lived in those areas. And then as time moved on, they realized that the writings in the caves were stuck there. They couldn't move them because sometimes uh, when they started migrating from where they were to other places, they had to take their history and all the records along with them. And then they began to write on clay tablets where they mold um, the clay in a manner as so. And then they did the same instructions on them. By this time, the drawings were developing into what we have letters now. And so the writings were now on clay tablets. As you recall, when Moses was going for the Ten Commandments, there was a tablet, and then the Lord inscribed the Ten Commandments on it for him. So that was it at the time. So history and everything else that needs to be kept record of was written on stone tablets. Now, can you imagine coming to church this morning, carrying my stone tablets, of Genesis to Revelation. It should be in a track, shouldn't it? Because it, it will be a lot. And so as generation passed by, humans decided it was too heavy. We had to make it a bit more light. And so at a point, they started using a, a reed, a plant. They call it the, the papyrus. They were able to mold this reef into a leather-like material so to speak. And they could open it for about 10 feet wide. And on these, they wrote the letters and the inscriptions and all that they wanted to, to write. Now it's become a bit lighter to move them around. Now they could, they could have leather, which had inscriptions. And then from those papyrus, they turned into scrolls. I'm sure you would have seen some drawings of scrolls. They, they were thin and very long. And then they will roll them as though um, um, as though the, um, the toilet paper. So they will roll it, and then where they unrolled it, it had the messages in there. And they started keeping them because letters can be kept for years and years, and they were a little light to carry. Now, after this, they had to carry a lot of information in a small area. And even though the leather was better than the tablet, we still needed space enough to carry them. And then came books. But even then, the books were very big. If you look at historic, um, historical um, documentaries, you see how massive those books were. They were very big. And then each leaflet in the book was really big as well. Recently, we have books 
that have very, very thin papers. We have on them a lot and a lot of writings in there. So one book like this can carry thousands of messages, thousands of words, thousands of stories, just one book like this. Where am I going with this? Even now, not even a book anymore. I can have one tablet this way and have multiple of these books embedded in one tablet like this. So I can have eBooks now, we have PDFs now, we have Word documents now, and we can keep these in our clouds and in our um, storage devices and, and all that. Technology has come to a point where books are all over. And this is where we are now. And you would realize going through the history of books, it must be important. If not, why would we have developed books to this extent? Books are very important because they carry all the information that we need to move on with. As I said, how would we know what happened 50 years ago? How would we know what happened in England when they started forming England without books? Everything is in there. And so when a scientist has a breakthrough and he decides, oh, when I put this and this and this together, I'm able to solve this problem. I need to write it down. So when I'm no more, someone can do what can make use of it. Do you see the essence of books? And then another person decides, but oh, when I built this house, it fell. But the second time when I built it, I put so and so pillar here in these particular areas. And because of that, the building is still standing. So I need to put it down so my next generation would know how to build this particular word, building. And so in our everyday life, we need books. But then the question would be, if we need books, what books do we need? And what books are we reading? I want to draw all our attention on one particular book. Books have the power to change lives. Books have the power to destroy lives. Books have the power to change generations. Books have the power to make us realize who we really are. It tells us where we come from. It allows us to know where we are headed to, to understand our nature and know how we do our things. But there's a particular book that is inspired by God himself. There's a book that has the power to change your life. There's a book that needs daily attention. As a young person, I recommend the Bible to you. Amen. I know you must have heard a lot of things about the Bible. A lot of people have bashed the book, said all sorts of things about it. Uh, recently on Netflix, there was this, uh, this program, Lupin. How many of us watched it? I'm looking at the young faces. Seems we don't, we don't enjoy TV these days. Wow, wonderful, wonderful. So Lupin, I know some people are discussing it. Lupin was, was, a, was a TV series on Netflix. And it was about a young man and his dad. They moved from Africa and um, stayed in Europe, in France to be specific. And um, unfortunately, his dad was, um, was framed. Um, yeah, was framed. And so he was imprisoned as a thief. He stole something. But when his father went to prison, he was meant to stay in prison for life. Now, when his father went to prison, he left his son, who was Asani, he left him a book. And the book had a lot of tricks for a magician to give the boy hope that even though his father wasn't around, he could use the tricks in the book to live his life. The end of the story was that Asani managed to vindicate his dad, let the whole world know that his dad did not actually steal anything. So this book had the power to make the man a good person in front of everyone. 
it had the power to give hope for the child so that he lived his life such that he will be able to vindicate his dad. If a book about a magician can do this, how much more will the Bible do for you? If we indeed put all the effort we put in like a sunny did with that magician's book. If we concentrate well on the Bible like a sunny did in that particular book, we will change lives if we are delving into the Bible well. We will inspire people if we are really reading our Bible well. As a child, when I was growing up, I was interested in listening to things from the Bible, but I wasn't particularly interested in reading the Bible. I don't know if you agree with me, but it seemed to have an old form of language. The yees and the thous and the yeas were a bit confusing for me. So I just didn't want to do anything to, to do with it. But I would just want to listen. And so rather, I was reading books which were more graphical. I read um, The Adventures of Tintin. Uh, does anyone know that? Blistering Barnacles. I, I love that book. I read almost all the adventures because I was seeing Tintin and Snowy do all the tricks and everything. I was enjoying it. I read um, Asterix and Obelix. Oh, you're young. It's also another comic book. Adventurous. I loved it because I had the photos in them and I was, I was following. And so I was grow as I was growing up, I started reading books without the, you know, the pictures and all that. I think the lesson here for us is to introduce the kids to the Bible in the right way. If we give the kids this one, they would easily reject it. And so it's up upon the parents to try to introduce the Bible the right way. You know, the ones that will appeal to them, the ones that they can relate to. When they go to school, they are not learning books like these. No, they are not relating to books like these. When they go to school, they have books for their level. And it is easy for them to relate to those books. So please, parents, you need to invest in books for your children. I know you make investments um, for personal things. You plan for things for yourself. But I'm telling you, if we invest for the right books for the kids, by the time they reach teenage, you wouldn't have to do much because you would have already embedded what you need to put in them there. You remember what the Bible said? Train up a child the way they should go. Do not train up an elderly person the way they should go. They would have already grown up. But the child, train them up well, and they will grow up and grow with it. Amen? So when I left the graphical ones, I started reading uh, romantic ones, fictional ones. I enjoyed Jane Eyre. Do, do we know that? Anyone know Jane Eyre? I loved it. And I remember... That was the first time reading a book without any photos. It took me months, if not a year. And I, I remember the, how I would imagine the people in the book and how it guided me to understand the story well. There were other stories I could go on and on. Now, because I had already started with the graphical ones, coming into the ones without the photos, it was easy. Now, at this point, I was also interested in youth activities. And that was the first time I was introduced to Steps to Christ. And then I read it. I didn't enjoy it at first because as I said, it was difficult for me to relate without the photos. But because I had started with Jane Eyre and other fictional stories, it helped me to have more time on the book. So I was able to read most of Ellen White books. I read on counsels to young people. I read to, I mean, messages to young people. I was able to read education, uh, the great controversy, and, and, and a, lot of, a lot of them. And I tell you, I would say emphatically that this training or this which I went through shaped me to become who I am today. Hello? I am saying this because a lot of people have asked this question when I was in school, training to become a pastor. 
most of the people I was in class with were elderly people. The question was, why would a young person decide to become a pastor? I mean, my peers were becoming the, the doctors and the, and the lawyers and the, you know, the ones that bring more money. I mean, that's what we all want. Anyway. And then you decide to become a pastor. It, it's really boring. Like, why would you do that? But it was because I knew where I was coming from. And I knew who called me. And I knew the relationship I had with him. It never bothered me. So for a young person to be interested in the Bible so much so that you can decide to dedicate your whole life to Christ, it must start somewhere. Hence, the need for us to understand the Bible. If you don't appreciate the Bible yourself, your parents can't do it for you. If you don't appreciate the Bible for yourself, your peers can easily draw you away from it. And it is so easy because from where we stand now in this generation, there are lots of things that seem to be so much more interesting than the Bible. You can go on your phone and have so many applications to do so many things for you. You can go on your tablet. There are so many things that will take your attention. And so the Bible is, is the last thing. Most of us have the Bible on our phones. But let's check when was the last time you opened it. If not for this, for this morning or for when the lady had to read the scripture reading. We have it on our phones. In fact, anytime we get a new phone, it's one of the first um, applications to download. But it's the last to actually open, if we ever open it. If it hadn't been that it had to update itself automatically, it would be at the very oldest version in your, in your phone. The Bible we have to have our personal relationship with the Bible and understand this. Let's read again 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. If we have our Bibles here. Hello? Yeah, if we have our Bibles. 2 Timothy. If someone opens, they can help me read. Chapter 3, verse 16. I read, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All the scripture, every word in the Bible is given by inspiration from God. When I ask you to read the Bible every day, this is what I'm telling you. The inspiration from God, messages from God. God has special messages for you. But if you don't go there, you can't find it. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It seems to me that the Bible is the manual for life. Because if you buy a TV, it comes with a manual. If you buy a phone, it comes with a manual. If you buy a keyboard, Mr. Organist, it comes with a manual. And without the manual, you're not able to operate it to its full capacity. So if you're not reading the Bible, Maybe that's why you haven't found your purpose. If you're not reading your Bible, maybe that is why you are still stressing in life. If you're not finding your anything in the Bible, maybe, maybe. Don't you think that is why you are never satisfied with anything you do? Because you are not reading your manual, that which would guide you in this life. We will answer two questions. First, so what evidence do we have that the Bible is as unique as we are talking about? What evidence do we have? Why are we saying that the Bible is an inspired word of God? We'll answer that. And then the second question is, as young people, what benefits can we gain from reading and studying the Bible? Should I even study the Bible? I mean, yeah, 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 you're so boring. You decided to become a pastor and so you want to convince me to, to read the Bible. I mean, I'm not reading. So what benefit is it for you? And I hope that you would find your personal reason, your, your own benefits, so that I don't have to wake you up in the morning to remind you to read the Bible, so that your, your dad shouldn't have to remind you to read the Bible. But personally, you know, 
I need to read the Bible for myself because of the benefits I have found for myself. So let's look at the first question, the evidence that we have. I will try and go through this quickly because I know this part usually bores young people very easily. Wonderful unity. The Bible was actually written over a period of 1,500 years. Can you imagine? Hello? Hello? Are we here? It was written over a period of 1,500 years. From 2020, when we had the COVID, till now. It's been long, right? But it's only two years. Are you with me? That's, that's two years. Okay, let's go back. 9-11 um, in America, when that thing happened, that was 2011, is it? 2001, 20 years. It seems like a long time. So from then, now is what? 20 years. I'm talking about 1,005 years. I need you to understand the reality of 1,500 years. And then you understand unity I'm talking about. So in a span of 1,000 years, some may never met each other. Some You need me to. Oh, okay. Hello. Some may may never have met each other because they also lived in different locations. They were not together, and yet the messages in the Bible are together, and they seem as though one person wrote everything. How wonderful is that? You know, in class, sometimes when we are given assignment to, to write on something, and then even though we are all given the same title to write on, we end up writing different things. Hello? And it does not seem to be unified. Even though we all stayed in the same class, listened to the same presentation, but the assignments become what? Different. Because our mindsets are different. But that is not the case with the Bible. Everything is in accordance. And it's unified. I'm trying to let you appreciate that it's not just some book written by some people out of whatever. But this is a special book. Like Timothy said, it was inspired by God. It's a special book. And that is why it's a manual for your life. And that is why it can change your life. And so within these 1,500 years, different people, let me read this. Example, Moses was a political leader and a judge. He was educated in Egypt. David was a king and a poet. He was a musician and a shepherd. Amos was an animal herder. Joshua, he was a military general. Nehemiah was a cupbearer for a pagan king. Daniel was a prime minister. Solomon was a king and a philosopher. Luke was a physician and a historian. And Paul was a rabbi, like a teacher. And yet, their messages are unified. Different people, different backgrounds, different cultures, different age groups. Yet, the messages in these writings are unified. I thought I was going to hear an amen from that. That amazes me. To have different people write things that are almost identical. If you look at the Gospels, four different people writing four different things. They all end up saying the same thing. That is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You would realize there are some stories in there. They may have used different languages to describe the same thing, but the theme of the messages in there are the same. Even though this one stood there, that one stood there, that one stood there, and yet what they wrote are in conformity, are unified. Amen. Again, regardless of all these differences, you would realize that the Bible has one theme. All that they were writing about was for man's salvation. 
none of them missed that. From the times of Moses to the New Testament times, everyone was focused on salvation, on your well-being, because they were writing a manual for you to live your life to prepare yourself for a special place. Amen? The Bible has one hero, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. None of them missed that. Everyone wrote and pointed to Jesus Christ. The Bible has one evil person. We all know him. I'm not even mentioning his name for him to get excited. And then the Bible has one purpose. Revealing the truth about life and God's character. Say amen. Evidence number two. Miraculous survival. So the book was written over 1,500 years. Some of them were written on stone tablet, like I told you. Some of them were written on leather, like I told you earlier on. Some of them were written on scrolls. And yet, you and I have the full Bible now. Do you understand that? It means the Bible survived. It's going through massive, massive changes in this world, but none of the words here have changed. So, someone was arguing. Um, he was, uh, is it Vol Voltaire? He died in 1778. He said, oh, the Bible... Because he planned to kill everyone who read the Bible and burn every Bible. And so he said, by the time he's dead, a hundred years after his death, there will be no Bible. And, and so what do you think happened? Because I have my Bible here now. In fact, history tells us 50 years after his death, his own palace was printing Bible. Can you imagine? So the Bible has gone through bad times and still survived. There have been people who have bashed it, saying, well, after all these years, but well, then the, the things in there might have changed. Or what they wrote isn't the same as what they, they, we have here now. Well, it was written in um, three different languages. The Hebrew for the Old Testament, Hebrew and Aramaic, some part of Daniel and all of that. And then the Greek for the New Testament. So how would we know that what we have now is the same as what Moses wrote. Let me tell you something. Recently, in, it's not recent actually, 1947, it's not recent. Nah, it's not recent. But it's recent in historical terms. So 1947, some of us here must have been born. 1947? 1947? Elder, were you born? Sorry? So you were born. Oh, wow. So, so some of us here were actually born. This is what happened. There's a story about the Dead Sea Scrolls. If you have time, you can Google and read about the, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this is what happened. There was this young guy who was a, a shepherd. He was taking his sheep around, around the ancient Near East, Israel, thereabout. And then uh, taking his sheep around, ba -ba 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 -ba, he went into a cave and there were some jars in the cave. And these jars had some scrolls in there. They stood about two feet tall. So these were very big jars. And in these jars were written some of the Old Testament texts. Are you with me? Now, history has preserved the Old Testament in its line as we know it. They wrote it down. There are people called the, the sufferings. They were called the countess. Now, they wrote it such that Every word they wrote, when they wrote there, that's number one. They wrote two, number two. They wrote going, number three. They counted every single letter they wrote to make sure they were not omitting anything from the Bible. So that is what we have had all this while. And so when the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, the guy went there and found out, it was up to the archaeologists to try to compare and see those that are always in the position of the Bible to see, really, no one has gone here. No one has touched it. It's been there for ages, around the time of Christ. Now, it is believed that a certain group of people, they were called the Essenes. 
these people preserved their writings because they thought that the Romans at the time when they were killing the Christians, they did not want the Bible to fade on the earth. So they wrote some of this and kept it. It was like a library for the, for the sect. And so recently when they found it, it was time for people to disband the Bible because if anything in there was different from what we have now, then it's a problem. Are you with me? And guess what? Every single letter to the, to the comments and the dots were right there. You can read it. Everything is there. If I have no reason to believe in the Bible based on the Dead Sea Scrolls, I want to believe it. Because they, they, they were in a different place altogether. And all this while, it's a different thing altogether. And then it only comes to confirm that, oh, really, the Bible has indeed survived. And every word in there, like he said, is inspired. Nothing has changed. I, I, I don't even know why you ignore the Bible. I don't know why. But everything in there has been preserved because it's a manual for you. God has a way of keeping his messages for you such that they won't change. They will still have the impact that they had thousand years ago. They will still have the information and the messages they had 2,000 years ago for you and for me. The Bible has gone through a lot, but it never changed. It is as it was. Amen. Like he said in Mark chapter 13, verse 31, that heaven and earth shall pass away, but what? My word shall never pass away. We may all die and go, but I tell you, the Bible will be there for our generations and generations and generations to come. Amen. Evidence number three, historical accuracy. What I mean by this is, so some places were mentioned in the Bible. Some names were mentioned, specific places. So how are we sure that this, this, it's true? And so there was a man, William Ramsey, uh, lived between 1851 and 1939. He was an atheist. He came from an atheist family. And he said he was going to prove that the Bible was wrong. Again, he decided to look at the, the book of Luke. Apparently, it has a lot of places in there. So he wanted to cross-check to be sure that the places mentioned in there correlates with the actual places we have now. So he set out and went to the ancient Near East, Palestine, Israel, those areas, to be sure, Jerusalem, places mentioned in the Bible. And this is what happened. He found out that 32 countries 54 cities and nine islands mentioned in the look were all real places. Amen. Now, instead of him going out to disband the Bible and to fight against the Bible, he now became a Christian and using those evidences to instead defend the Bible. Did you read your Bible this morning? It took him years and years to come up with these evidences, only to now defend the book you are avoiding. Only to defend the book we have to push down your throat to read. Only to defend the book that unless on Sabbath and you hear John chapter 35, then you begin to flip. The book that has gone through ages and ages and ages. And why does the Lord keep protecting this book? It's a special book. Hallelujah. Evidence number four. The fulfillment of prophecies. Another thing is that there are so many prophecies in the Bible, thousands of them. And so have these prophecies actually been fulfilled? Have they come to pass? So when, when, when a prophet says something, that which would happen in the future, for instance, if I am a prophet, and I say, tomorrow, this and this and this would happen. If I am a good prophet from the Lord, that and that and that that I said must happen. And so if the Bible is authentic, then the things that it said 
should have happened or will be happening. Let me read a few of them. The years of the ministry and death of Christ was prophesied in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 to 27. And it came to pass. When they were writing Daniel, Jesus was not born yet. There's a thousand years difference before Jesus came, but it was fulfilled. The place of Christ, uh, where Christ was going to be born, was prophesied by Micah, um, according to Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And then it came to pass. The miraculous birth, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And then it came to pass. The star that would announce its appearance, that is Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. And then that also came to pass. So every detail of the Savior who is the focus of the message in the Bible, was already prophesied. And then indeed, it happened. At this point, I don't think I have any doubt that this word is inspired by God. So let me just move on to our next question. So as a young person now, 21st century, I have eBooks, I have PDFs, I have apps and all of these things. What is the benefit for me? Why should I read the Bible? What is it going to do for me? Number one, reading the Bible allows you to know God. Hello? We have not seen God. We have only experienced him. And by faith, we believe that there is God. By reading your Bible, it allows you to know God. So if you have questions about your belief in God, go to the Bible. If you have questions about why should I even worship God? Why should I come to church? Why should I fellowship? Why, why church and worship and all of these things? Go to your Bible. It allows you to know God. And this is what I had to say about it, that knowledge is one thing, but having experience of the said knowledge is everything. Are you with me? Having knowledge is one thing, but having experience of the said knowledge is everything. It is not enough to just know God. More importantly, we have to experience him. There's a story about a young man who tried to convince an elderly person about God and Christianity and all of that. The man was doubting for years. He's had a lot of sermons, a lot of things, but he, he just won't believe in God. And then the child told him, you stand outside and try to understand the temperature of a room inside. Is that possible? Hello? Can someone stand outside and decide what kind of temperature we have in here? It can't work. So unless you actually taste the apple, you can't look at the apple and tell me it's a sweet one. Or it's a sour one. You can't do that. So unless you've actually experienced God, unless you've actually taken a step towards him, unless you actually made a move to walk with him, to understand him, I tell you, some of the things some Christians say may be foolishness to you because you haven't come close enough to feel the experience they are feeling. And so if you want to understand him, I implore you, you have to experience him. Just for, just for doubting and whatever sake, give yourself a year, experience God, and let's see if you're going back. Give yourself a year. Say, this year, God, I need to experience you. If not, I'm going back. No church for me. Let's just do that for a year and see what happens. Test. A year is so long. <laughs> Mom says a year is too long. A month will do. Maybe a week. Maybe a day. Maybe an hour will do. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And I don't think you're ever going back. Benefits number two. For the young man who has decided I will not read the Bible. I have nothing to do with the Bible. Benefit number two. Listen. Says, reading the Bible gives you wisdom. Yeah. Because he said, Proverbs 2, verse 6, for the Lord gives wis wisdom from his mouth, from, sorry, for the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Wisdom is the experience that you get in the knowledge that you've acquired. 
So in order for you to have that wisdom, you would have had to align yourself with the Bible. You would have had to allow yourself by the help of the Holy Spirit to understand the word of God. Then you are endowed with wisdom. Someone asked for wisdom. Solomon. And his works still today, we still talk about. His reign was a special one because he asked for wisdom. So young man, young woman, if you want to be wise, if you want to have wisdom, try the Bible. Amen? Benefit number three might be the last one. Reading the Bible leads you away from sin and to an abundant life. Psalm 119 verse 9 and 11 says, how can a young person stay the path of purity? By living according to your word, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Amen. So you want to live a righteous life. Some have said it's not even possible to be righteous on earth. You, you can't do that. It's because you haven't tried. Everything around us seems to draw us to go the darker way. And, and unfortunately for our generation, sin has become nice. It's become pleasing because it's been painted to look so beautiful. So if you're not in the habit of doing the right things, the wrong things become the right things for you. If you don't make it a habit to be telling the truth, lies becomes normal for you. If you're not in the habit of dressing well, then dressing anyhow becomes normal for you. If you're not in the habit of talking like a Christian should talk, then talking like any other person becomes normal. But we must be different. We can't be like everyone else. The, the, the argument is, well, I, I need to be like everyone else. I need to talk like everyone. You don't need to do that. You must be special. For you to be chosen, you must be special and different from every other person. It's okay. It's fine. And so you have different beliefs. It's okay. It's fine. Well, everyone does it this way and you, you do it this way. Well, that makes you unique, don't you think? And so for us to live a life of purity, we can't go without the Bible. The point is, we cannot live our lives on earth without consulting to our manual. And God has messages for you every day, every time, every moment of your life. Everything you go through, I tell you, God has a message for you. From this marvelous book, he wants me to remind you in Joshua chapter 21, verse 45, that not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord has spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. In this book, he wants me to remind you that in Psalm 23, even if you walk in the valley of the shadow of death, he says he will, what? He will be with you. I don't know what your shadow of death could be. It could be that you are failing in your exams. It could be that you don't understand anything when you go to school. It could be that you are sick. It could be that something is suppressing you. It could be that psychologically you're not even stable. But whatever your valley of shadow is, he is with you. He said to remind you in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, he said, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future of hope. I know it's scary to think of your future at this point. When you think, oh, what am I going to do tomorrow? Or what's going to happen in the next 10 years? It scares a lot of young people. But the Lord said to remind you, the thought he has for you is a future that is bright. It's a future that is beautiful. Listen, he says, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me. And I will listen to you. Amen. And you will seek me and indeed you will what? You will find me. He said to remind you in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, that he made you for a purpose. And that is why you can't live your life anyhow. And that is why you can't go to certain places and do certain things. And that is why you need to be special. Listen, he says, for we are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You were thought of before you came to this earth. There is a purpose for you, and you need to find that purpose and walk right in it. He said to remind you in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, that you can trust God. It is difficult to find a trustworthy person these days. But God can be trusted. Don't trust me. Now, I may say this today, tomorrow, I may say the other thing. But I don't even trust myself. Yeah. Because sometimes I decide I am waking up in the morning, 5 a.m. I even set the alarm, 5 a.m. And when it's 5, I snooze it. I snooze the alarm and sleep more. Even though I decided, I made a plan to sleep and wake up five in the morning. How can I trust this body? Nah, I don't trust myself. But God can be trusted because what he says, he will do. What he said, he's done. He, he doesn't change it. When he says A, he means A. When he says B, he means B. He said, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Amen.